Now, it is said that if you want to test the strength of your compatibility in a relationship, then the best way to do that is to go on holiday together. And this is because being constantly in close contact and proximity with each other, especially over the festive season, almost always raises challenges and is why in the legal fraternity January is known as divorce season. Now in some instances lockdown has caused some of the same problems leading to couples uh, to realize that they are no longer compatible, no longer want to live together and uh, this has resulted in a rise in divorce petitions. So to tell us more about this I'm joined now by Shani Faniker who is the Senior Associate of Family Law at Adams and Adams. Shani good morning thanks for speaking to us good morning lovely to be here i think you know one would hasten to say that um although lockdown cannot be fully blamed for divorces uh many couples are forced to assess if they are still compatible if they still want to live with their spouse uh, now that they have been forced to live in closer proximity as a result of the lockdown. And we've also reported of instances of gender-based violence and couples realizing they no longer want to be together. But how many divorce petitions have you actually dealt with during this lockdown? Has it been more than usual given the same period ordinarily? Unfortunately, there's been quite a uh, extreme increase in divorces that we have seen. We've received a lot more queries regarding divorces. During lockdown, we were quite busy, but we've seen a very extreme increase directly after the December holiday. Now, please talk to us about that and, and, and this notion of divorce season. Why is it that an event like this, a pandemic like this, or after the festive season, people decide to call it quits? There are various reasons, and let's start by usually, without the pandemic, we usually saw an increase in divorces directly after the December holiday. The reasons are that people are spending more time with each other than what they usually do. Uh, during the festive periods, we see that people have that extra glass of wine, and unfortunately, very often when you've had that extra glass of wine, the words seem to, to come out slightly easier. The tensions are also increased. The children are in the house. The two parties are in close proximity to each other. And they just realize that this person is not for me. People also make New Year's resolutions. And often a New Year's resolution is a new year, new me. I don't want my husband or my wife anymore. What we have now ever seen is that the pandemic has increased that number of divorces even further. And I think the reason for that is is that the pandemic has caused an even bigger financial stress on couples and on people in general. And the moment that financial stress is there, marriages unfortunately suffer. Now, Shani, who actually petitions the most for divorce during this time? Is it men or women? And, and what are some of the reasons? Um, I actually think it's quite balanced out. Um, I have not necessarily seen that it's more women or more men. The reasons, there are various reasons. I often see couples or individuals that come and see me around October, November, and then they indicate to me that, you know what, now I know what I'm entitled to, what my rights are, but I'm giving it a last go. I'm having this wonderful family holiday during December. And that's why we say people, you know, give it this last shot, the last holiday. And unfortunately, a wonderful holiday does not necessarily cure the actual root of the problem in the marriage. Mm. Uh, speaking of rights, so uh, let's quickly speak to the rights of those who petition and the rights of those contesting or refusing the divorce. Well, obviously, where there are minor children involved, the best interests and the rights of the children will be our paramount uh, importance and we will focus on that first. The rights of the individuals, whether it's the man or the, the wife, depends on the, the facts of each matter. Your rights will be dependent on you know, your position in the marriage, have you been working, have you not been working and the like. And are we able to actually say um, in terms of age groups and um, racial demographics where we are seeing most of these divorces, Shani? I have lately seen an increase in older people getting married. 
Um, you know, very often they call it the seven-year itch. So we have a lot of divorces where people have been married for, let's say, less than 10 years. And the last few months, I've seen an increase in long marriages that uh, dissolve. And I think the reason for that is, is that not holidays, but also the pandemic has slowed down life to a certain extent. People are forced to, to be with each other more. Where in the past, people just live past each other. You go to work, you come home, you go to bed, and you know the routine repeats it. Suddenly, now after 20 years of this type of life, you are spending a lot more time together in one place, together under one roof, both working at home, and those tensions seem to rise. And, and, and that's a very interesting point as well, because as you say, very often uh, people outside of the pandemic were able to successfully navigate some very weird circumstances where they could live past one another in the same space. Uh, but now, when you're forced to live in that same confined space together, it exacerbates uh, some of the issues that you've been dealing with. And then you have the national state of disaster, uh, which also comes with regulations among them saying, you can't kick a person out uh, unless they are able to find um, an alternative uh, accommodation for themselves. So this could force people to stay together, even though they have come to that point where they decide that they want to get divorced. How much of that are you dealing with? Unfortunately, quite a bit. You know, we saw in the past that going to the office is escaping from home. Now people are locked up with this person that they don't want to be with every day. Unfortunately, we've also seen an increase in domestic violence because where people could you know, run to the office to hide, but they are now locked in with their abuser for longer periods. Mm. And, and, and you spoke about children earlier on and how this affects them, where children uh, perhaps would need to change schools and uh, all those sorts of things. And during this pandemic, uh, that is even more difficult to do. Unfortunately, you know, in all divorces, regardless of the pandemic, the children suffer. It, I mean, their whole family is being torn apart. Their roots are being uplifted. So children seem to be experiencing a lot more trauma in divorces these days because the I've also noticed that the, the acrimony in the divorces seem to have increased as well. Um, and children always are the victims in the divorce. And speaking to the acrimony, because, you know, uh, w what does that mean if we were to flash that out? Are people, you know, quibbling more over more of the stuff in the marriage? People are angry. I think people that are even not going through a divorce are experiencing anxiety and stress and they're angry. Now, couple that with the divorce, you know, you've got this enemy now. And unfortunately, that's what happens in divorces. And it's like people are channeling their normal stresses, their anxiety towards this one person. Mm. And, and, and of course, then you have issues um, in the instance where someone has to move out uh, of child support. Uh, but uh, the child support issue is an interesting one because you can live with someone and demand child support, Shani, can't you? Yes, of course you can. You can always approach the, the maintenance court um, for maintenance. When a divorce has already started, there's a, a process called a Rule 43 for interim maintenance to ensure that you know, people are maintained during the course of the divorce. And like I said, the maintenance courts remain open. Maintenance is something that has been affected quite a bit um, by the pandemic. People's salaries have decreased. And that's an unfortunate reality. If you have less to pay, unfortunately, that is a reality. And, and I was going to ask about that because, as you say, because of the pandemic, there's more joblessness and uh, people unable to perhaps meet their child maintenance obligations. So what happens in that instance? People must just remember that you cannot simply stop paying maintenance if you have lost your, um, your income and you can't just unilaterally decrease the amounts that you pay towards your children or your ex-wife or your spouse. Um, the best would be to, to consider mediation. You know, 
speak to the other parents, say, this is my position, this is what I'm able to pay, and this is what I cannot pay anymore. But you cannot take the law into your own hands and just stop paying. Children need to eat regardless of this pandemic. Mm. But, but, but how do you deal with someone who says, who simply does exactly what you say should not be done? Um, someone who simply... Uh, walks away uh, from their responsibilities and how do you actually deal with that as the other party? Well, it, it depends on uh, the circumstances. You can either you know, issue a, a writ of execution if there's a rear maintenance. You can approach the court for a contempt of um, court order. You can approach the maintenance court and, and so forth. So it depends on what grounds the parent is supposed to pay maintenance. Is there a court order or is it just an agreement? But the courts are open for this. And very often in our courts, children are seen as urgent matters. So the urgent court is open should you have to lodge an urgent contempt of court application to demand the maintenance to be paid. Mm. And, and as you say, uh, this whole process is one that's very acrimonious. And sometimes it's, it's drawn out. But what do you do in the instance where one party is completely done with the marriage, with the union, and the other party is holding on for dear life? Unfortunately, you cannot force someone to stay married to you. And we see sometimes in divorces that the party who does not wish for the divorce to be finalized does use each and every tactic possible to delay the divorce and, you know, to waste time in the hope that the other party will realize somewhere during the litigation that they still want to try again. But the reality is, is that you have, it takes two to tango. If the one party does not want to continue with the divorce, there's really nothing you can do. And uh, perhaps, Shani, uh, just in wrapping this up, uh, it all comes down in the end also to the different marriage contracts that we enter into at the onset. So uh, speak to us about that, you know, in community of property, out of community of property, uh, anti-nuptial contracts, accruals, all of that, please, in a nutshell. Let's just start to say that social media is great, but unfortunately there's a lot of fake news and uh, incorrect definitions on social media. And very often when people walk into my office, they don't even know what their marital regime is, how they were married. So basically there are three ways to be married. In community of property, which means that everything is shared. Out of community of property, which means nothing is shared between the parties. And then the third one is out of community of property with the inclusion of the accrual system. That simply means that at date of divorce, the two estates, the one with the larger estate, will have to pay half of the difference to the other party. These three marital regimes will be set out in your anti-nuptial contract. So when you get married, people sign an anti-nuptial contract and there you have to elect which marital regime you want to be applicable to your marriage. And it's very sad that people walk into my office and they do not even know what their anti-nuptial contract says. Mm. So, so in other words, it's a good idea to actually speak to someone to get these legal definitions and uh, an actual understanding of the marriage contracts before you actually enter into a marriage. Definitely. Um, what I very often see is that you sign a, you know, a, an anti-natural contract in your 20s and then you get divorced in your 40s, 50s. And then you have to deal with a decision that you made in your 20s. And at your 20s, you possibly didn't even think about divorce. You know, you just signed away thinking happily ever after. Indeed. So, Shani, I think uh, this has been very helpful. Thank you so much uh, for being with us this morning. Shani Fanika, Senior Associate of Family Law at Adams and Adams, talking to us about married couples deciding to separate amid this lockdown and what lawyers call divorce season in uh, January uh, where you just see those petitions going up at Shani saying that overall uh, they are seeing higher numbers of petitions um, during uh, starting from the lockdown period so very interesting this is uh, let's uh, quickly take a